What's up, everybody? Jay Miller here bringing another Productivity in Tech podcast. And this week, we have the one, the only Tom Merritt. Tom is not only an author, he, he just released Pilot X, his new book. He is also a podcaster himself and quite a big deal in his area. He is the showrunner for the Daily Tech News Show. He is also the co-host of Eats Me, uh, East Meets West, Current Geek, Sword and Laser, Cord Killers, and After On. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's such a lovely intro. Thank you. Well, it's it's a long intro. <laughs> Normally, it's just like, here's my guest. Guest, how are you doing? <laughs> so Yeah, the guest does one thing, and that's simple. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's, it's quite all right. In fact, that was actually what led me to bring you onto the show is before when I first invited you, I was on this like serial, I'm going to host a bunch of podcasts free. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I just had to stop for my own sanity. So I'm wondering, what has it been that has kept you running a lot of these shows for a very long time? Well, uh, I think I have, in fact, finally reached my limit uh, recently, but I just do things that I enjoy talking about. My main gig, Daily Tech News Show that you mentioned, is a daily half hour to 45 minute uh, discussion of the tech news of the day. And it's something I've been doing in one form or another since 2005. And I kind of was doing it before that in a, in a different way, not as a podcast, but in different job elements. And it's just something I really like to do. I like to get up and see what the tech news is. And I would do it whether I was doing the show or not. And, and in fact, in, in small periods of time where I wasn't able to do a show like that, I still got up and read the tech news of the day and wanted to talk about it. So I think that's the key. And, and it goes for everything else. Cord Killers, I'm really into television and cord cutting. I'm a current geek. We get to just talk about you know various geeky topics that are of interest to us. Sword and Laser is all about science fiction and fantasy books, which I enjoy reading. So I, I mean, there's lots of other details to it. But the main thing is I'm talking about things that I enjoy and things that I would be interested in and investigating anyway. So I mentioned before we, we started recording that we weren't going to get too deep into technologies, but just wondering, how are you collecting all of these news articles? Because I've heard you come on with like new articles, like right as the show is starting. Oh, the the majority of of my news collection comes from a handful of sources. So every morning when I start to put together, I, I actually do a show called Daily Tech Headlines, which is just a, a five minute show of the most important headlines of the day. And I use that as the basis for making the longer Daily Tech news show later in the day. So the first thing I do is I start looking for articles that are going to either go in that or in Daily Tech news show. And I use Feedly to look at what I consider the best sources, not because they're the only sources, but they're the sources who are go going to point me to the important stories, uh, no matter where the source is. So there, there may be really, really good quality things like Tom's Hardware or something that I don't have in those feeds, but I have blogs that will always point to the great story at Tom's Hardware, et cetera, et cetera. So I look through all of those feeds and I mark stories in Feedly, which is what I use for those. And then I go and I open Google News to see what it thinks are the top technology news of the day. I look at TechMeme to see what their their editors think are the top technology stories of the day. And I look at our own subreddit. And then I sort of triangulate, or I guess quadrangulate, all of those different sources to see, okay, what are the things that everybody's talking about? No matter what I think of those, those should go in because everybody's talking about them. And then what are the ones that seem to be getting a lot of attention, at least in a couple of those areas? And what are the ones that I just think are interesting or follow-ups to things we've talked about or provide a different angle that you might not see otherwise? Very nice. And and I've heard of the the subreddit. So in at first I thought like everything was coming from there. So that was going to bring up a question about outsourcing, but it sounds like you have a really like regular routine. Is that I mean is that true? Is like is it wake up in the morning and then in yeah. that order feedly Google News tech meme? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wake up in the morning, I pull out my Android tablet, I check the weather and the news, and then I look at Feedly, and I mark those stories. And then when, I, when I'm ready to determine the lineup, I look at Google News Tech Meme and the subreddit. Uh, and that, that is the routine every morning. 
and and it's trying to correct for biases. So the subreddit has a few thousand people in it now, but it's still a small percentage of the overall audience. So I want to take that as one signal, but I don't want that to be the entire signal because it's not representative. Google News gives me an algorithms view, which kind of tells me these are getting posted a lot. So a lot of people are covering them. Tech Meme tells me what a more human-oriented editor thinks, who's got the job of looking over everything. And then there's my own biases that I'm trying to correct for, which is one of the reasons I say, if I see it on every source, tech meme, Google News, subreddit, and my own feeds, it's going to go in, whether I like it or not, because that means it's worth talking about because everybody's talking about it. So obviously in today's climate, and I know that you you spend a lot of time looking at not only tech, but also with politics, um, there, there's a lot of stuff going on. How do, you, how do you continue to function when it's your job to look at the news, but then the news isn't always uplifting? I, I look at tech news. Uh, like I said, I, I, I do check, uh, I, I read the BBC app every morning just to find out what's going on in the world. And I don't overpay attention. I mean, if something tragic happens or something very important happens, I'll go seek out uh, a good article or two about it. And I have a few other news sources in my feed that I kind of use to keep an eye on things. Uh, I've got uh, BuzzFeed, uh, Weekly Standard, uh, along with the BBC News in there to kind of to kind of give me a little wider view. But mostly, I just read the tech news. And granted, sometimes uh, the the politics news of the day does spill over into tech news. But I try very hard not to talk about politics on the Daily Tech News Show unless it's related to technology. So if it's net neutrality, fair game. If it's about broadband rollout, fair game. If it's about something else, there's no need to get into it at that point. Let's talk about uh, something that your show is actually really intriguing for, and that is the regular guests that you have, or I guess the regular co-hosts, and mm -hmm. and then the occasional uh, subject matter expert. How do you find some of these people? Because I I think about you know you talked about doing uh, body modification in the form of implants, and you had an expert on that, and then you you have you know, a, a French correspondent that covers, you know, a lot of news from a European perspective in, in Patrick Beja. Uh, how do you how do you make these connections? And and what is it like, I guess, when you say, hey, I have a problem. Let me talk to um, my my European correspondent or let me talk to my body modification <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I had like a big Rolodex or, or, or a virtual Rolodex, which, you know, I just had every single topic and, and who to talk to. Uh, I, I've got something that's kind of similar to that. But but honestly, the uh, the people like Patrick Beja in France and Veronica Belmont, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Shannon Morse, Darren Kitchen, those are all folks who I've come to know from doing podcasting. Uh, they're either people I've worked with directly in the case of Veronica in the past, or they're people who've also done podcasts that I've gotten to know, <clears throat> say at podcast conventions or just by corresponding over the internet. Uh, that's Scott Johnson. Scott and I just kind of became friends by trading tips and being on booking each other as guests on each other's shows. So I've been lucky to find those kind of people because of the internet, I would never have found, you know, someone in France who is as interested in all of this stuff as I am if it weren't for the internet. The the subject uh, experts, I, w I think we could be much better at. I think we could be more systematized at. But the way we do it now is when we find a topic that's interesting, uh, my producer, Roger Chang, will go and contact that person and see if we can't get them to come on the show. Sometimes it's easy. Uh, if it's a if it's a person we've talked to before, we have a previous working relationship with, sometimes they don't get back to us at all. And, we, and we, those are the ones you don't know about because they've never been on the show. Uh, but we sort of take it as the topics catch our eye and then work from there. You talk about Roger's role in the Daily Tech News show, and I know I'm, I'm like pounding this because for, th for the listeners that don't know, I've been listening to DTNS for three years now, and some of these things have been just constant. Like, I know, I know I'll always hear Roger's voice every once in a while. Well, now I'm a patron subscriber, so now I hear it every, every day, but you, you hear some <laughs> of these constances, but... With Roger being a, a producer, we just had a producer on uh, with Mandy Moore, and she talked about her role 
not just in, hey, I edit the podcast or, hey, I record the podcast, but, you know, she also handles social. She does, you know, booking guests. And you mentioned that that's kind of one of Roger's responsibilities. What was it like bringing Roger in or has he just been there from the beginning? Well, it's funny. Uh, the first producer of Daily Tech News Show is Jenny Josephson, and she now works at Marketplace. She's still involved in DTNS as an advisor and and, and a sounding board, which I find invaluable. Uh, but I got to know Jenny because she got laid off from Yahoo almost exactly at the same time uh, that I was let go at Twit, the, the network that I worked at previously. And our mutual friend, Molly Wood, who I used to do a daily news show about tech with called Buzz Out Loud, uh, knew Jenny from working with her and introduced me to her. So that was just through a friend. Uh, Jenny previously had produced for CBS News, and and she had a great resume and great instincts. So she helped me get the show off the ground and develop it. Uh, but when she needed to have... Uh, a little bigger job. Uh, she's worth more money, <laughs> to, 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 not to put too fine a point on it, than, than we could pay. Uh, I brought Roger in to start helping because Roger and I go way back. Roger uh, and I worked together at ZDTV back in 1999, and we've worked together on and off over the years, and he was in a position where he needed something part-time because he had just had a baby. So it worked out that as Jenny was needing to get something a little more, uh, this job worked for Roger, and they're both extremely qualified and and uh, could not do the show without a producer. You know, you mentioned going back all the way to 1999 in in the tech news space. Um, I, I'm I'm a millennial. I'll admit, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm that age. <laughs> I'm in that age group. So our attention spans are not that. Uh, we'll say long lasting. I, my, I I can't stay focused on, you know, what I had for breakfast this morning. Let alone something that I've been doing since 1999. <laughs> how do you, how do you keep that fresh? Because I mean, that's the goal. Everyone wants that career. They want that thing that they're doing for the rest of their life. How do you how do you keep it interesting? I I don't know exactly what the answer to how to get there is. But when I was a millennial <laughs> in, the, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, I'm Generation X, uh, I had the same thing. I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had ideas. I would try things. I got into radio uh, when I was 16 years old and loved it. But there were a lot of things about radio that I didn't love. And so I, I stayed doing radio for a while. And then I went to grad school and I worked at a bookstore and I did some plays uh, and I did some access television. And basically, I tried a lot of things and I didn't compromise what I enjoyed uh, to do them. So if I really had wanted to get into radio, I would have done shows that I didn't enjoy for, for radio stations I didn't respect in places I didn't want to live with the hope that eventually I would climb that ladder and become Ryan Seacrest or something. Uh, but I didn't do that. Instead, I just kept trying things until I found the internet. And that was lucky that it you know, became a thing that was possible in the late 90s and realized, oh, this is, this is something I enjoy and I have control over it. I can do it the way I want to. So in 1996, I started my own website. It was a parody news website, very similar to The Onion. Uh, it, it had roots in a zine that I had printed that I that came out around the same time as The Onion. So I'd had the idea before The Onion. They were just way better at it than I was. But doing that website taught me how to make a website, how to make content that worked on the internet. I actually hired people to be correspondents and write things for the website. So I learned how to manage staff. And because I was doing that for myself, I finally found this job in San Francisco at ZDTV that needed someone who could do all those things. And in my cover letter for the interview, I said, hey, your job description is for all these things. Here's me doing them on the internet. And I do them right now for free for no money. So I can certainly help save you money because I know how to do stuff for cheap. Uh, and the person who was hiring for the job thought that was great. And she hired me. And eventually I found within Tech TV and then later CNET, the kinds of things in there that I really enjoyed because I knew I liked video and I liked radio and I liked writing and I liked tech and I always had. Uh, and so it, it just took a long, long time 
to finally narrow it down to by the time I was 30, having an idea that maybe, maybe this was close to what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until I was in my mid thirties that I actually was like, you know what, this is what I like doing the daily news show about tech. This is my thing. And so that's how I'm able to continue to do it from there on. It's a lot of trying a lot of different things and, and having them not work out prior to that. You mentioned possibly being the next Ryan Seacrest in another world, and my mind immediately went to seeing Tom Merritt as the uh, the, the host of American Idol. <laughs> this so is American Idol. <laughs> but no, I, I fully agree with that. And, and one of the other things that you did mention is that the people that helped you get to you know where daily tech news show is right now you still keep around you you know you have you know you have Jenny on your board of advisors that was in my opinion for for Pitt we went through this long struggle of okay what do i do next because for when i say we it was me and maybe a, a guest writer mm-hmm. that we had every now and then but i had so many people that were just like i really want to see this thing evolve to whatever the next stage is and it's like well i don't quite know what that is so the first thing that i did was uh i put out a contest and said hey if if you want to see it grow i need you to invest your time and your money so your money by becoming a patron at a certain level your time Mm -hmm. by becoming an advisor and you know i now we meet every single month we meet once a month which I, i got that from you and we talk about we talk about what's going on. We we that's the only time I look at the numbers is like, hey, this is what we did last month. This is what we did this month. Here are the things that I did different. So maybe that helped. Maybe it didn't. And then we talk about like future plans. You know, productivity and tech is about to go into personal productivity coaching, and we're about to start doing courses. There are a lot of things in the air, but I would have never thought of those things had it not been for the people that were around the show since episode one saying hey, this would be a great idea, and just pounding it into my head for a year and a half. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And one of the things I learned when I was at ZDTV and later Tech TV when they changed the name uh, was how the audience could be involved in your content and how much that would help you if it was. Uh, and I, I continued that at CNET uh, with Buzz Out Loud and, and, and soliciting that feedback and trying things and saying, hey, do you like this? Uh, and to the point with, with Daily Tech News Show, I'm, I'm constantly paying attention to what the analysts say. We, we have a Slack for our what we call our analysts. They're our top-level patrons. And I'm, I'm also paying attention to what people say in email and on Twitter uh, and in comments and doing surveys, proactively going out and asking people, like, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And, and floating those ideas because... There's always something that we could either do better or used to work but doesn't work anymore. Uh, for example, there was a segment called The Calendar, which we did on Tech News Today, and it worked great for the longest time. It seemed like a really important thing to do, and I carried it on at Daily Tech News Show. I was doing a calendar segment, and then it started to just not feel very valuable anymore. And I, I went, nobody was complaining about it or anything, and I went to the survey and I said, you know, which segment would you miss if it was gone? Uh, And basically everybody said, nobody said calendar (laughs) is what it it amounted to. And so we took that segment out. Uh, And that's just a one small example of it. But the idea of working with the people who are invested in what you're doing, I think is a really important one. So that brings up my, my next question. How do you get those people to talk? Because I feel like that has been a primary struggle in productivity and tech's um, existence. We have plenty of listeners, plenty of you know followers on Twitter, Facebook, and those things, but very few people are vocal. Very few people have ideas that they want to share. Well, you you have to give them a reason to, uh, and that that's a really easy thing to say. It's a little harder to figure out what that reason is. But I've had co- I've had shows like I did one at CNET called The Real Deal, where we talked about how technology works, what what the real deal was with technology, uh, and I I really encouraged people to send in their own tips or their own thoughts, and people didn't because. I, I think they didn't because it sounded like work. To them, it was, oh, well, I come to this show for you to tell me those things. I'm, I'm not going to tell you those things. So you have to figure out, like, what is the thing that sparks their interest? 
you have to give them very easy avenues, which I'm sure you do, but just for completeness of anybody listening, you have to make it easy for them to communicate with you. And you you have to be where they are. Uh, so I've I've had some uh, podcasts where everybody's on Twitter and that's where they want to communicate. Some just want to communicate by email and others like Sword and Laser, uh, we're all on, everybody's on Goodreads. So you, you, you don't have a one size fits all approach. You have to figure out where does your audience spend time? What, where are they most comfortable communicating with you? And then you have to be open and solicit that. And I think that's the hardest part of it, which is how do I find those topics and those things that, that really engage people's minds? I still am surprised by which topics on Daily Tech News Show will cause the flood of emails to come in uh, when I thought, oh, this this is the topic that's really going to get people going and I get nothing. And then I'll do maybe a side topic that's not, I didn't even think it was that important and suddenly everybody gets excited about it. I, I think it's always interesting what people get excited over. I, and I've, I've even looked at that too. It's I've, I've noticed this inverted trend of the popularity of the guest versus the attention of the audience. It seems like mm. when you have someone that is, you know, I, I can't say like hyper famous, but we'll say like micro famous and they're their own little space. The numbers are always lower than the person that, you know, I find on Twitter that I just find to be interesting. And, and when we get on the air and talk, mm. I, I think that part of the interest is one, that person feels like, hey, I'm getting to share my voice. So they're more adamant about letting people know that they got to share their voice. And then two, it's a fresh take. It's a new thought. That's why I like the guests that I pull. I don't try to pull, you know, the high, I guess the high end uh, productivity experts or the high end developers. I try to find the people that are in the position of the listener, the person that says, hey, I've been listening to this mm -hmm. show. Hey, I, I go through what you've been going through. I have input. Yeah. And, th and the other thing I would add is when you give people a voice on the show, uh, which is why we've always read emails and taken voicemails in every show that I've ever done, it encourages more people to write in because they're like, oh, I'm actually going to get heard. Even if you don't read theirs, you don't have to read all of them. Uh, but just the fact that you read some kind of makes people realize, oh, they actually pay attention. It's not just going into a void. Also, I just respond to emails a lot. If, if there's something where I know I'm not going to read it on the show, I'll try to make an effort to respond and say, hey, thanks. This is a really good point. Very true. I actually sent you an email about your productivity system, and I was surprised. Not only did you respond, you responded quickly. I mean, I, I expected like, yeah, hey, he'll get to it if he does. If he doesn't, oh, well. But I think it was like less than eight hours. There was like, oh, hey, yeah, here are my thoughts on that. And I was like, wow, that's that's quick. And <laughs> but and, and I like that. I like that you you make yourself available for your um, for your community. And that's important. Yeah. And, and there's a certain point where you can't, uh, if it gets to be too many things coming in or too many requests, you have to manage that. But one thing I discovered when I, you know, I went to work at, at tech TV and it was a big television network and I thought, Oh, well, we, we're going to get so much email and we're never going to be able to deal with all of it. And we did get a lot, but I realized pretty soon because I had access to the fan mailbox for the shows that it was totally dealable and then we could respond to people. And so I, I did it more often. And I, I think that's just carried through that people really appreciate that if you can do it. I don't often talk about productivity tips on the air, but when I do, they're usually a good one. Here's a good one for that. For anyone listening, if you don't feel like you have enough time, just give yourself a certain time limit. So say, Hey, I'm going to answer as many as I can in the next 10 minutes. And then after that, I'm going to drop the rest. And you'll be surprised at how many you can answer in that limited amount of time. Yeah, I, I deal with my inbox uh, where if I see something come in, when, I, when I, I set aside time to look at it, first of all, I'm not constantly checking it. And when I, when I go to look at it, uh, if I see something that I can answer or deal with right away, I do which is probably why it felt like I got back to you so fast is that I had an answer off the top of my head and I took 20, 30 seconds to, to write it down and send it. Uh, then there are the things that I need to 
move off to somewhere else. So I either put them in my calendar to be done or I will do the thing that you're not supposed to do and I'll leave it in the inbox to do. But I do try to keep that. I don't keep inbox zero, but I keep inbox less than 10. And I make a point of going in once a week and clearing it out uh, if, if stuff starts to float and making myself take some sort of action out of it and pulling that straight out of getting things done. It's not something I came up with myself, but that idea of don't just let it sit there and get to it later, do something about it, put it on a to-do list, put it in a calendar or whatever needs to be done. You know, as you were talking, it made me think of an episode of Mr. Robot, which I believe you've watched, you've seen before. Yeah. Um, and that's when, um, when Eli or Malik's character is talking to White Rose and she says, you have three minutes. <laughs> and he's like, what can I accomplish in three minutes? And it's like, well, some people hack systems. I hack time. And they have mm -hmm. a full-fledged conversation over the course of three minutes where a lot of valuable information is shared, which really just shows it doesn't take that long to to do that thing that you you've thought that it would take. You just have to say, I'm going to set this boundary and I'm going to apply myself. And then when it's, when time's up, time is up. Yeah. Because I think what happens, especially with inboxes, people see more than five and they think this is going to take forever. And those five things may each take 10 seconds to deal with, but it's, it's the cognitive overload of, I have to do a lot of things. I don't want to do that right now. Uh, and, and that's why going in and saying, you know what, I'm just going to answer one will help because you answer one and then you realize, oh, well, that was fast. I can do one more. And th this is a trick I do to myself. And then I do the one more and it's like, well, now there's only three left. You know, I might as well do those. Uh, and, it, and it really, you, you kind of have to hack your brain not to be overwhelmed. Look at Tom Merritt, the inbox hacker. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> not that kind of inbox hacking, a good kind of inbox hack. Yes. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about the podcasting side, I wanted to talk a little bit about your book. Um, one, sci-fi, that is that is a very, I would say, niche market. And it kind of falls directly in line with the, with the tech environment that you're in. Mm -hmm. Was that intentional? Was that just, I have a fascination for tech, I have a knowledge of tech, so let me incorporate as much of that into my writing as possible? Uh, it was certainly not that was not a conscious thought. Uh, I write stories that I, I come up with because they're interesting to me. The fact that they end up being science fiction mostly can be explained by what you just said, but it, it, you, it sort of works the opposite. I come up with a story, I start writing it, and it's informed by the things that I'm interested in, which are science fiction and technology. So it makes sense that they would end up being sci-fi stories. And then, of course, I, I have to ask the question, where in time do you find the ability to record so many podcasts and then just happen to publish a book on the side? Yeah, I would like to know how I do that, too. Um, so I could I could figure out uh, how to better balance my schedule and not be run quite so crazy sometimes. Uh, but the couple of things that I think work to make it happen is I have a daily task to either write or edit a book. So I, I will go in and I, I have a Word document open with a, something that I'm working on. Uh, it could be writing from scratch or it could be just polishing up something else. I have also, except for this past year, for for other re for unconnected reasons, I have done the National Novel Writing Month where you sit down at November 1st and you commit to writing 50,000 words of a novel, novel in a month. And I've done that, I did that for five years running. And so I would always have something original that I may have been playing around with all year, but that month is when I turned it into a story. I turned it into something. Uh, and I did that because I just wanted to motivate myself to do stuff. I'm not saying it's the best way to write a novel. It's not. Uh, but it's the best way to get yourself the time to do it because it, it is a task that you can achieve. It's like 1,600, 1,700 words a day over the course of a month. Then you got 50,000 words to work on the rest of the year. And that's how Pilot X was done. I, I came up with this idea while watching the Doctor Who 50th anniversary special. And then I toyed with it for a year until the next November when I sat down and turned it into an actual story. And then I polished it for a year uh, as, as part of my daily write and edit task. Uh, and then I crowdfunded it on Inkshares to get published. 
So from idea to finished project, that I mean, that took a few years. Yeah, and 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 the the key is that's not the only book that I was working on. In it, it was just in those little spaces of time that I've set aside for working on books that it existed. I've got another one that I'm coming out with shortly. I'm working on the cover right now. And I've got one more in the can that I'm having people uh, that I'm having people beta read. And I'm uh, the one that I should have written this past November is National Novel Writing Month. I'm still finishing up, uh, but I've, I'm almost done with that too and ready to go back for a second pass. So I just I enjoy doing it, and I want to get better at it. And the way you get better at stuff is to practice, and so that's why I do it that way. So I I think I know the answer to this question, but is Tom Merritt the writer? Or the podcaster, or something completely different. Well, I would say, I, I Tom Merritt is not someone who usually refers to himself in the third person, so <laughs> that's that's a little <laughs> unusual for me. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm someone who enjoys talking about concepts, playing with concepts, and trying to explain them. So the podcasting that I do is me trying to understand and explain. Those are those are kind of the two main drivers of all of the shows that I do. Daily Tech News Show is very much about understanding and explaining, uh, trying to understand what is technology doing to us and explaining what I've figured out or what I think is happening to people and, and carrying on a conversation, not trying to explain necessarily in the way of the definitive answer, but trying to explain what I've discovered and keep that conversation going with the audience so we can all get a better understanding. Uh, the writing is just playing with concepts, like what if? What if it worked this way? What if there was a race that had time travel? That's just letting my understanding brain have a little free reign to imagine stuff. Okay, I, I like that. And and I do like the fact that it's not, well, I'm first and foremost this thing. It's this this is what I'm about. This is this is what grabs my attention, and the things that I can do around that, those are occupations. It doesn't it doesn't make the person like I I find. Yeah, I I have a lot of conversations with friends about goal setting and and doing uh, things you know because this will lead to that, and sometimes I just keep quiet because it's not really why I do things. I don't set goals. I look for opportunities. I'm opportunity driven, not goal driven is how I've said it to myself. And, and by that, it's sometimes that could sound like a kind of a cop out, like, Oh, so you just make it up as you go along. But to me, it's more about the, my goal. If I had to define it as a goal is to enjoy what I do. So I figure, what are the things that I enjoy and how can I spend more time doing those and less time doing things that I don't enjoy? And a side benefit, uh, you know, aside to that is, well, you have to be able to make money doing those things you enjoy or else you won't be able to do those. Uh, and, and that's the trick, right? And it's not an easy trick. But if you keep looking for opportunities to do that uh, and focus on that, rather than saying, well, I have to compromise all of these things because I want to get to that goal of being rich or being executive. Uh, if that's what makes you happy, you should do that. But that's never been what drove me. What drove me was doing interesting things. And how could I make my day full of more interesting things? I don't know if that makes sense. It, it definitely does. And it makes me think of one of my favorite writers, Haruki Murakami, um, who I just finished his book, What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. And and this is a, a person who has written several novels, not just in his native language of Japanese, but also it translated them to English and translated many other novels from English to Japanese. So this is someone that writes a lot, but he finally gets into the point where, you know, writing is only a part of what he does. You know, he's also a runner and swimmer and he runs a marathon every year and he runs many half marathons. And He's even ran an ultra marathon, which I didn't know even existed. But when he does these things, it's I do them because that's what I do. It's not necessarily, oh, I, I didn't get the time that I was looking for. So now I'm a failure. It's, well, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm going to have to figure out how to train better while still going to, you know, my sports therapist. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to writing, it's, you know, I write the stories that I want to write. The The first few stories that he published were big successes, 
even though every publisher he tried to send them to told them they would be massive failures. But he published them anyway. He, he published them through little literary magazines, and they took off. And, and I think that there's an importance to jumping in and doing things because they're fun, doing things because you enjoy doing them. Um, I, I always, my goal has always been to make productivity in tech the brand what I do, make that my business. But as I learned earlier this year, that can hold many forms. It's not necessarily hosting the podcast. It's not necessarily hosting four podcasts. That's why we got rid of three and went just to the one. It's not just coaching. It's a culmination of those things that ultimately make you or make the brand whatever it is. And that's important not to get caught up in the one particular thing instead of looking at what the bigger picture is. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. You you need to iterate what you do and, and keep trying new things, but also focus on building on the successes that make you happy, that, that, that make you feel like you're going in the right direction. So I have two more questions and then we can jump into the bonus round. All right. My my next question is going to be when Tom Merritt isn't thinking, talking, writing about tech or pondering and re-releasing into his audience, what is he doing? Because that's that's all we see. What is what is Tom Merritt when he's off the clock or is he ever off the clock? I'm almost never off the clock. I mean, that's the blessing and the curse of all of the that stuff that I was saying earlier about, oh, just make the stuff you enjoy be your be your job. Uh, when I sit down and watch television, a majority of the time, it's something I'm going to talk about on Cord Killers or possibly Current Geek. When I go to the movies, same thing. When I play a, a Hearthstone video game, that's probably me relaxing, but it's also something I could talk about on shows. So it's, it, you know, when I'm, when I'm not doing the shows i'm doing things that will feed into the shows but yeah i mean i i like to i like to go out to eat uh with my wife we we love to to experience good food and try new restaurants and try new things we like to travel uh we like to to visit different areas uh you know we've gone to japan and we've gone to italy uh, we're lucky enough to be able to do that uh and and i like to play with my dogs we have two dogs and and we love them to death and so taking them for walks and playing fetch and and all of that kind of fills up some time too well you've kind of already leaned into my last question how is your summer of puppies Ah, the summer of puppies. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life. I, uh, I, I'm i a huge dog lover. I know I wasn't always in my life, but I've become a huge dog lover over the years. And things were uh, so intense at some point, right around the beginning of summer, uh, that I, on Twitter, said, I'm just going to post a picture of a cute dog every day until the summer is over to help me get through this. Uh, and I made it hashtag summer of puppies. And I added it to my task list. Daily, I have on my task list, post a puppy picture. Uh, and sometimes I'll cheat a little bit and I'll just retweet somebody else with the hashtag. Um, but it's uh, it, it has been fun because not only does it make me have a fun thing to do to try to catch one of my dogs doing something cute and post it to the Twitter, but also getting to see other people starting to get into it and post their pictures. If you're not into dogs, it's going to sound really dumb to you. And if you're not into cute things, it's, you know, you could be cynical about it, but it makes me really happy. And that's what's important. I, I did have, I guess, a kind of a, a follow up question to that. Are you familiar with the podcast show? Uh, Can I pet your dog? I, you know, that sounds really familiar. I think Veronica may have mentioned it to me before. Yeah, there's a, I guess my wife is a member of their Facebook group and she's, she's always, we have two new puppies. Uh, they're, I think five months old at this point. And, oh, what kind? Uh, they're they're mixes. They're uh, part Rottweiler, German Shepherd, Border <gasps> Collie, and Siberian oh my Husky. Gosh. So oh my, they're like, I my 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 dog that passed away in January was a Rottweiler Shepherd mix, and we have a Border Collie mix, and we just got another Shepherd mix. Oh wow! So they'd fit right in. Yeah, we got we got two little girls. They're sisters. Uh huh. That's great. <laughs> but yes. Uh, when when I saw I, I I heard you mention summer puppies and I I knew of the podcast and then uh, recently my wife just said oh hey I posted this picture of our dogs up to uh, you know can I pet your dog and I was like I wonder if Tom Merritt's a part of that 
I know. I, sh- I need to look that up. I should be part of that. It's a Facebook group. I will I will send you a, an email to it so you can you can put that in your someday maybe list. Got it. All right. Well, before we wrap up, um, there's so much to point out, so I'm not even going to try that again, but let people know how they can uh, find out about all the awesome things that you're doing. Yeah, the easiest way to find out what I'm up to is to go to TomMerritt.com. It's T-O-M-M-E-R-R-I-T-T dot com. It collects links to all of the shows that I do, and there's a page that has all the subscriptions and everything. Uh, If you're mostly interested in tech news, though, you can just go straight to dailytechnewsshow.com where you can subscribe to the show or to the Headlines show. Uh, The Headlines show is also available as an Amazon Echo flash briefing if you've got one of those. Uh, And you can follow me on Twitter. It's a really silly uh, username that I've had for a long time, and it's persisted so long that I just keep it out of sheer absurdity. A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T. But if you search Tom Merritt, you can find twitter.com slash Tom Merritt, and that will point you to the right place. 